Good evening, televiewers, and welcome to yet another exciting session on Daily TV. I am your host, Kingsley Shetenewu. Today's session, as usual, will comprise of questions that have already been sent to us by you, our viewers. Meanwhile, you are still free to keep more questions coming. Uh, I will intermittently be taking some of these questions. Uh, be respect respectful with your questions. Uh, our guest uh, today is someone who needs no introduction. He is known to some simply as Dr. Common Sense. To others, he is the interim president of the Federal Republic of Ambazonia. He was appointed to that position a month uh, following the arrest and the contentious uh, tradition of uh, Julius Ayukabe from Nigeria to Cameroon. Um, he was therefore called the acting interim president at the time, a title that appears to have changed. He studied theology and is an ordained minister of, and, and a Christian counselor. He is currently based in the United States of America where he has spent several years. In addition to his current role as interim president of Ambazonia, he is active in, an active minister of the gospel. He was formerly a trade consultant and also the former uh, president of the Community Humanitarian Emergency Board International. So without uh, much ado, uh, shall we uh, welcome Dr. Samuel Ikome Sako? No, you are, you are alive now, sir. So. Okay. Welcome to the Thank show. You. Thank you, Mr. Kingsley, and um, thank you, all televiewers for making uh, it to this appointment. Thank you for giving me the privilege to talk to the world and especially my people who are in pain. Thank you for every opportunity I may have to answer one or two questions. Okay, so um, I would just go right away. You see from my introduction, I wasn't really sure. I was rambling as to what exactly to call you. So are you um, the acting interim president, the interim president, or just the president of Amazonia? I am the acting president of Amazonia. Also not interim. Um, it is it's just a mistake. Um, it is the government that is interim, it's not the, the president that is interim. Uh, I believe yeah. it's the, the president of the interim government or the acting president of the interim government. So oh, I am the acting president, president of the interim of the government. government. And now, now that clear is classy for me and I'm sure for many people because that was a, a bit of a contentious issue. So um, in the introduction also, I mentioned you are a minister of the gospel. I mean, how do you combine the two, your role as a politician and, and a pastor? Is there any conflict? There is just no conflict. Um, because the Bible gave us the Ten Commandments. And uh, I can show you clearly that um, the, the Bill of Rights, all the Bill of Rights are drawn from the Bible. Because the Bible is the foundation of our Western civilization. And uh, whether it's the right to life, whether it's the right to private property, whether it's the not to steal, uh, respect for, for uh, the, uh, um, the, 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 all the human rights, they are derived from the love for one another as you love yourself. So this, this the Bible is the, quite the foundation and he who knows and believes and practices the Bible it is naturally a good politician. Politics is not, it's not the practice of evil but it's the practice of the good for the good of the majority. Okay, sir, thank you for that uh, clarification. Uh, but before we get into more sticky stuff, um, please, um, we'd like to know a bit more about you. Um, like maybe your background, family, are you married? Do you have children? Yes, thank you. Thank you for that opportunity. I am uh, from uh, FACO division. Uh, especially from uh, Boya, uh, local government area. I was born in Tiko, 
I grew up in Tiko. I did my primary education there, did my secondary education there, uh, up to um, uh, the um, sec um, form four, because uh, I lost my, my uh, sponsors at, at form four, but I was able to do my ordinary levels at home and did my advanced levels at home. I booked about four papers at home and then before I proceeded to Nigeria. In Nigeria, I studied in the University of Calabar uh, where I got a first class in uh, languages and linguistics before I came back home. Then I proceeded here uh, at the, to the United, uh, um, United States Virgin Island where I did a master's degree in restorative justice. It's a branch of theology, actually. It deals with um, <clears throat> crime and, uh, and uh, societal um, evils. But we are looking at it in, in restorative justice. We look at the criminal as a victim. So the, the focus is to cure the the crime by curing the victim. Because we sometimes uh, um, uh, we look at the criminal in a normal society, we look at the criminal as, as the problem. So justice is retributive. We think that by punishing that individual, we are able to stop the crime. But in restorative justice, we know that if that individual becomes the focus and is restored, then uh, he will become a better person, and, and crime will be, uh, wow. will be eradicated I, I without punishment. So then I did my, my uh, doctorate, same university, uh, uh, in biblical counseling, which is a more extended uh, domain in, in that area. <laughs> yeah, well, so, that's, uh, that's quite... Uh, yes. That, that's quite interesting. I mean, uh, considering yes. um, that we will be talking about... Um, issues today that have to do with, you know, um, retaliations, retaliatory attacks, defense, and things like that. So maybe it yes. will be easier when we get to those to be able to put them into the context of uh, restorative ju justice, as you, you put it. Um, you have published a book uh, titled, Let the Righteous Many Step Out, Our Christian Values and Geopolitical Choices. I've not um, been opportune to read the book yet, uh, so, can you just tell me and the viewers what, um, in a few words, what the crux of that book is about? I wish you did, Mr. Kingsley. I'm sure we'd have had a better conversation. No. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it is a summary of my experience from my training and my experience in society because I've been very active in civil society. But I came to understand that. Um, Evil in society is not perpetrated by the majority. The majority are always on the side of the victim. Because mm -hmm. whether it is stealing, whether it's killing, whether they are the wars that we are fighting in this on this planet, the evils we suffer are perpetrated by the few, by the minority, but suffered by the majority. Mm -hmm. And why these things persist is because the majority is either not doing enough or it's not doing what it's supposed to do. And sometimes they stay back instead of stepping out. Stepping up means doing the things they ought to do and be where they have to be in order, in order to stop this uh, minority, sometimes very dangerous, very vocal, uh, that is having all its way and making the society a bad place. <clears throat> so my, my intention, and, and you know, with the Bible, the righteous actually are those who have a, who, who 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 call evil evil, and know what the difference between good and bad, and who are rightly positioned before God. When you when you are you have a right standing with God, they say you're righteous. Righteousness it does not mean that you can't you can you are not capable of evil. But when, when having a right standing with God puts you in a righteous position, where your conscience rules and not just what is good or bad. In the eyes of men. Now, these are the kind of people 
who should step out, whether they are in, pre in the press, whether they are in industry, whether they are in politics, whether they are in, in, the, in the military, whether they are in science and education, they should step up. Otherwise, the, the evil few will continue to dominate the world and make the world a bad place. And that's what Donald Trump said when he addressed the, um, the United Nations in uh, 2017. He said, if the evil, if the, if the, if the, if, if, if the righteous many do, do not come out to stop the evil few that are, that are really terror around the world, the world will continue to suffer. Yeah, uh, so um, if I understand, are you talking of righteousness just from a moral perspective or um, are you saying that we really need more religion in, uh, in religious men and women in politics? And uh, just so that we get a bit of context, um, there is research indicating that the most um, religious uh, uh, communities tend to be the most developmentally backward communities. So is there not a problem inherent in religion? particularly in how it was uh, brought to Africa? Oh, I don't know where your statistics come from. That I will leave you with that because you have your sources. Now, yeah, well, America, I mean, it, not, let me give you a bit of context. Nigeria, for example, let's take Nigeria. I mean, I don't think there's any society in the world that is then any country in Africa that is more religious than Nigeria. On certain streets in Nigeria, uh, you have more churches than houses. Um, I think there, there is even a, a publication showing that for every letter of the alphabet, you've got a church. I mean, I was in Nigeria and even on the buses, you get people preaching. But we, when we begin to look at the state of politics in Nigeria, you would question how that transformed. Then when we take to Cameroon, for example, um, uh, the president of Cameroon is very religious. I mean, he visits the Pope. Uh, he, he, he goes there, he takes communion. So... Um, what I'm beginning, I'm trying to understand is, do you, are you advocating that more religious people should get involved in politics? And if so, does that automatically translate to righteousness? Well, uh, I did not say, that's why I carefully avoided the word religious. I would have said, let the religious step up. Okay. I made sure that, that I did not use that word because they are not the same. Uh, I, thought, I told you about having a right standing that from the point of your conscience, for those are the kind of people that are called out to make sure that they don't just condemn or endure what is evil, but they start doing what is right in order to make society a better place. Now, uh, religiosity is just the efforts of man to get to, or to God. And people make efforts in many ways. Uh, uh, and, and, and that does not translate to uh, a righteous person. It all depends according to my definition. So uh, I don't want to go there because that is taking me too far, far away from my focus. Because uh, I have statistics that prove that 75% uh, that America is 75% Christian. So does that make America a religious society? Now, depends on what what makes a my man religious? Uh, what makes a nation a part of a particular religion? What about the Muslim countries? Some of them, they complete, they say they are 100% Muslim, uh, Muslim. But you go there, everybody is not practicing that. And those who are practicing that are not righteous by my definition. So the focus is the individual. <laughs> and my uh, advocacy here is not that a particular religion uh, becomes a theo makes a theocracy as a standard for the whole nation. That is not good because it leads to intolerance. I really, mm -hmm. I'd rather that, I'd rather that the, the people who have been transformed by what they hear and practice, who have a conscience that is awake and alive, should be the ones who can handle public affairs because the destiny of many depend on their decisions and their actions. And, uh, and uh, because autocracy has killed more people Autocratic governments in the world have killed more people than First and Second World War because people are suffering because of that. But meanwhile, they are the few who are in charge. But the majority stay quiet. They stay aloof. They stay mute. They don't do what they're supposed to do. They shy away. And then that's the problem. So then there is a quote um, I saw at the back of your book. It says, we need a complete reshuffle of the political game players in our world. 
Uh, this can only happen as Christians come to understand and take their place in society as a salt that should purify and preserve the world and the light that illuminates the dark corners. Uh, is that the summary of what you were just saying? Yes, my, 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 by this, uh, I, I, I mean that um, it is, because let me say this, the people who have good, a good conscience, the people who have, uh, who have a right standing before an invisible God so that they are judged not by the laws of evidence, but by the laws of the conscience. <clears throat> These people tend to demonize any act that they think that uh, those who are involved in public life are all evil. They are all bad. They do bad things. So there's no need to be involved. Those people have the, have the habit to stay away because they think that they say, I don't want to soil myself. I don't want to get myself involved. Uh, let, it, let it be. The best they can do is to pray for those that are trying to make an effort and who don't have the qualities probably necessary. So that, that I'm saying that until those people begin to understand that they have to make the moral choice of stepping forward and being transformational leaders for our society, our society will continue to remain and go the same direction. The, uh, 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 because if the Bible says that you are the salt of the earth, uh, imagine the salt of the world without salt. If the Bible says you are the light of the earth, Imagine the light, the world without light. And the light is, is, is what makes life, or that bring, makes life, that makes, that gives, a, that makes the world a good place. So if those that can lighten the world, that can preserve, bring preservation to the world and bring healing to the world, uh, I mean, in terms of the ills and the problems that we suffer, if they are the ones who stay behind and say, no, that's a dirty arena, I don't get, I will not get involved there. I, I don't want to stain myself. I don't want to go there. Then this, this, the leadership of the world will constantly be in the hands of the wrong people and the majority will continue to suffer. All right. Uh, thank you so much for clarifying that for me. And um, I mean, uh, I would really want to read that book. And like you said, uh, I think we can have a whole discussion on that book because it's a... Um, it's a it's a topic that I'm very very interested in the how the the the, the linkages between uh, politics and religion and geopolitics and all that. But um, let's just look a, a bit about your ministry. You are a minister of the gospel, and from my yes. understanding, Christ, on whom on whom Christianity is based, um, came to the world with a message of peace. And um, there's a biblical passage uh, that really uh, always speaks to me, and that's Luke one from verse sixty eight to seventy nine, and um, is the canticle of uh, Zachariah. Some people just call it the Benedictus, you know. And just so some of our viewers have a bit of a context and why that appeals to me in this context is, um, at the time Zachariah made um, those pronouncements, those prophetic words, uh, Israel was under occupation from the Romans. And uh, there, were, uh, there was this yearning for freedom. Uh, it was understood by many as political freedom, but from uh, Zachariah's words, uh, it's clear that they are looking um, for religious uh, freedom, for spiritual freedom, because he, uh, in uh, 78 and 79, uh, verse 78 and 79, say, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Um, now, the question I have is this passage talks about peace. And if you link it to, to Christ's um, a word in um, uh, Matthew 5, verse 9, which says, Blessed as are the peacemakers, they shall be called sons of God. Um, I want to ask you, um, Pastor Sako, are you a peacemaker? Yes, I'm a peacemaker to the core. I, I, there are two levels. You make peace between men and make peace between God and man by telling them the good news of, of, of Jesus Christ. So in that domain, I remain a peacemaker and I do practice the peacemaking. And that's why I privilege dialogue in um, reconciliation. Uh, that, 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 so some people will be looked upon as some weakness, it's not. 
it is the way of life of anybody who is a peacemaker because you always give peace a chance. But the idea of peacemaking does not depend on one person. It depends on two persons. If I'm willing to make peace with you and you are not willing to make peace with me, then it will not happen. No matter how much I, I try, no matter how much we try, if God is willing to make peace with you and you are not willing to make peace with God, no matter how God tries, there will be no peace between you and God. So I believe in peacemaking, but it is not a unilateral act of man, of one person. No, it is a bilateral action. God loves and gives, and you are love and you agree. So there's reconciliation. If that does not happen even in the realm of man, peace will be a difficult task. In that case, God is going to judge us, not by the peace we achieve, but by the effort we made. All right. Um, so you, uh, you, you, you took me by surprise there because I remember on the 31st of December, your New Year's speech, um, you said that you were moving your strategy from a defensive to an offensive strategy. And uh, what it struck me was that you were going to be now more offensive. And within the context of uh, wh what you were talking about, you had a situation where the Cameroon military have killed civilians, they burnt villages, over 210 villages as of the last count. And uh, we've got situation where people have been called black legs and all that. So when you talk of offensive, does that include say maybe killing Cameroonian soldiers or killing people who are attacked as black legs? Okay. If you want to attack my family, you, you start by planning to do so. There are two ways I can respond. If I know what you're doing, I either wait for you to come and hit my door, and then I come up with whatever I have to defend myself, which is the, uh, the, the natural instinct. This, this one is the normal thing. Or if I know that you are preparing something a block or two away, and the destination, according to the practice, is for you to come at night while I'm asleep and you come and take me out or attack my, my domicile or my hideout. I can come, I can make sure that I, I, I come and meet you where you were while you are yet preparing to come and attack me. And I make sure that I take out your capacities. If I do that, it is called offensive. It's not defensive because I am actually attacking but with the intention of defending myself. So that is an offensive strategy. Where we sit every day, we know that these people are here, they are coming from this way, and they are going this way, and their intention is to kill, to maim, to burn villages, to kill, uh, and to rape. And then we wait and allow them to come right there to do what they are coming to do. So the best thing to do is to make sure that you, you don't give them that liberty to plan, to prepare, to move, and to attack you. If you can take out their capabilities from wherever they are organizing, that's an, off that's an offensive strategy of defense. That's good. Oh, now, um, within the context of um, the, the passage we talked about, uh, Zachariah, again, because I'm really trying to look at this to wrap my head around it within the context of Christianity, where Christ uh, basically talked about turning the other cheek, telling if someone takes a cloak, a cloak um, you know, and uh, moving an extra mile. Maybe I am looking at it from with carnal eyes. Uh, you might shed uh, more light on that. But if you look at it again within the context of uh, Jesus' crucifixion, um, he was tried in the Sanhedrin. He was later tried by Pontius Pilate. And all these were, there were political connotations around it. But uh, when he was being arrested, he told the person who struck out with the sword to keep his sword. So he did not advocate for it. He could have called on the warriors from angels, from heaven, the angels to come and fight. So Jesus did not physically fight. Is it not contradictory that um, uh, this uh, struggle has been called um, God ordained and then we've got this religion uh, religious background to it, yet we advocate to actually actively um, take human life or in the name of defense. 
I'm, I'm trying to just reconcile the two. Yeah, thank you for that question. I dealt with it in, in, a, in more details, in greater details in that book. So let me just take you through some, some, some important points. When did Jesus know that his disciples carried swords? Those disciples were basically fishermen. But what, how did they get swords? Normally, fishermen don't deal with swords. But every one of Jesus' disciples had a sword. And uh, when they attacked Jesus, a disciple asked Jesus the question, should we, take, should we use the sword against them? Because they had swords. The question was, should we come against them and stop them? That means kill them. How do you come against the sword against somebody who has a sword? You kill him, right? You stop yeah. him, you stop him, you stop him. Say, should we do so? Then Jesus said, no, not so, for now. You know, the reason why Jesus said they should not it was because at that particular time, it was already fulfilled that Jesus will be crucified. The, the moment for his crucifixion, the moment for his divine mission's fulfillment had come. So that was not necessary. So that's why when Peter went ahead in, in what he's supposed to do in self-defense, he still applied the principle. He took the sword and cut the soldier's ear. Jesus did not condemn him for cutting a soldier's ear. Jesus did not tell him to throw away the sword. He wasn't appalled that, what are you doing with the sword? You are a man of God. What are you doing? He said you should keep it. He did not say you should throw it. He said keep it. That means not for use now. You don't have to use it now. Because at that particular time, it, it was the time had come for Jesus to be given so he said, you keep it because you will need it. But don't use it now. And so, when he told him that, um, um, he took the ears, put it back and said, he that lives by the sword dies by the sword. That's another uh, um, uh, saying of Christ that is misinterpreted. Now, the question I will ask to help us in... Uh, Biblical interpretation. Was Peter living by the sword? Peter was not living by the sword. And therefore that message was not for Peter. That message was for the soldiers. The soldiers were living by the sword. As a soldier, you live by the sword. So Jesus is saying, why do you want to kill a man who lives by the sword? He will die by the sword. Now, but in particular, when we go back, we discover that Jesus made the reason why he said, put the straw back to his shelf is that it's useful. Keep it. Because, but now is not the moment. Because the moment had come for Christ to be given as a sacrifice to be slaughtered. So from that background, you see the disciples, the, the main disciples of Jesus, practice self-defense by carrying swords. And if you attack them, it was not the moment when Jesus would tell them that, I know this moment more than you, so just keep it. If you attack them, they will use that sword very well against you. In the Bible, let's go back before Christ. The kings, whether, whether it is David, whether it is uh, uh, all the prophets of the Bible, they are people that God empowered if, if, if David he empowered them to go into battle for the defense of their land. If God is righteous, he cannot, he couldn't have ordered anybody in the Bible to go into a war in defense of his people. If God is righteous, he is not capable of one sin, right? If God is righteous, he is not capable of one sin. And if God will come order his own and even direct them on how to do warfare, that they are encamped on the east, you go by the west, you will come against them from the south and you will deal with them. God is righteous. That means that one is part of his righteousness. 
Wow, well, okay. Yeah, well, I get that. And, um, you know, um, the, the, the contentious issues between whether the Old Testament Christ there, uh, transformed the law um, when he came there, they were fulfilled the law and things changed with the New Testament is um, uh, another topic of debate. But I just want to ask you, what is the message you've got? I mean, there are accusations that uh, Ambazonian fighters have been involved in human rights abuses. I have two cases that really stand out for me. I mean, there's the case of this Lydia from Muyoka who was tortured and uh, I've learned she died. Um, in the video in which she's tortured, I hear um, they say it's General Obi. And then there's the, the recent one in uh, Bali where women and children were being uh, beaten uh, by Ambazonian soldiers. I mean, there are all, uh, lots of other accusations found in a lot of published documents. Uh, what do you say to them uh, when they cross those lines? I know you've also spoken in your speech that I did mention, you talked about uh, issues of kidnapping and stopping those things, which means you do acknowledge that some people um, are actually involved in kidnappings. Um, we've seen Ambazonians, not, perhaps not directly uh, under you, but we've seen accusations of um, uh, priests being kidnapped by Ambazonians and uh, the recent being the case of uh, uh, Father Diodene Bonnier, who was kidnapped by the Bui Warriors, and uh, the Bishop of Kumbu, who was also kidnapped yesterday and then released, or uh, two days ago and released. So uh, what is your message uh, for people who commit those atrocities? Yeah, you know, uh, Mr. Kingsley, there is no perfect war. <coughs> because war itself is the breakdown of law and order. <coughs> And in for a, a new order and the order of of men with with firepower are the ones who rule and control. When this happens anywhere in the world, they are bound to be excesses. The most important the most important thing for any, for political leadership is is to make sure that those actions are properly condemned, and those perpetrators are pe the pro properly properly. Uh, the, the acts are properly investigated and perpetrators are brought to, to some kind of discipline. You understand that I, in my capacity, I lack the control of my territory. So, and without territorial control and effective control of who and who is involved on the ground, it, it becomes uh, impossible for, for, me, for, me to, for us as a government to do what we're supposed to do. But in this context, the government of Pobia is held completely accountable because they have put all their oppressive infrastructures on the ground. They claim that that territory belongs to them. And as long as that claim remains, therefore, they have the judicial powers, the police powers to ensure that even in this situation, which they have always tried to downplay, they are able to hold account or to account people who are doing such wrong things. But for us, we have made sure that we made laws, we made statements, we issued disclaimers. We, we did our best within our space to uh, investigate and see uh, who is doing what and if we have a hold uh, on, that, on those individuals and we can stop them. <clears throat> then I want to say that in this chaotic situation, there are many actors in play. There are, um, there are the, the people who are answerable to our authority, the ones we call genuine restoration forces, because they hear our voices, they recognize authority, even the, their own commanders, that I can, can pick, we can pick a phone and call somebody, who call somebody, who call somebody, and they, they, there is a chain of command, and we can be able to trace that this is done like this, then we can correct. Then we can have, uh, the, we, we can be able to correct one thing or the other. But there are also others who are, being, who are just creatures, created by uh, the oppressor to promote the agenda, to create chaos in our camp, to make us look bad so that, because, because who, is an, who is an Ambazonian fighter? Anybody who is not putting on a uniform uh, who, who wears a gun on the streets of Ambazonia. He's an Ambazonian fighter. Even the criminal, who, who, there was other, others who are criminals, there were crimes before the, the war, so will there be crimes during the war. Even criminals who, are now, who have now found a space to use whatever they can find to, to commit crimes 
and aggravated theft. When they do that now, they do it without uniform. Ambassador, we don't have uniform. So they say, who, who has done it? They say, Amazonian fighters have done it without an investigation. And that's why I decry, I, I, I decry the situation where journalists, people who are supposed to report facts, have become so biased that it, instead of saying gunmen, gunmen, unidentified gunmen have done this. They say Amazonian fighters have done this. What proof do you have that it's Amazonian fighters? Just because the person was not in a military outfit of the Republic and the person had a gun, therefore, it's automatically an amber fighter. If the person calls and asks for, uh, like kidnappers, ask and say, I am General this, and speaks in a voice and say, this is my phone number, put this amount of money here. They say it's amber fighters. These are individuals. These are some of the criminals. And these are people who have been planted by the system to make sure that they tarnish our reputation and, uh, and, uh, and, and draw sympathy away from the atrocities that they are committing against us. Uh, the land public is busy committing genocide, and they, they, they want the, the eyes of the world to turn away from us by giving them the impression that the, those they are killing are all criminals. So when they kill a criminal, why do you, why do you sympathize? They are all criminals. No. Atanganji has hired his own militias, all the CPDM uh, um, um, uh, lords, and, and all those who are desperately protecting their hegemony. They have hired their own lords, trying to uh, uh, create a confusion is that, and, and maybe tarnish our reputation, promote the oppressor's agenda. They are there. Who knows? And they, they all appear the same as we. But the difference is that they are not under our authority. They don't listen to us. They don't take our orders. When we say release them, they don't even release them. Anybody who is under our authority, when we say release them, they will release them. When they even arrest them, we will know that why they are, took them, probably for questioning, probably for one thing or some confusion, but, but they, will, they will do exactly what they have been asked to do. But not this situation where uh, I see funny situations. You want to check, find out from their chain of command, nobody knows who is doing that. And nobody has a handle. Those are either criminals, hired hands, or plants, uh, pl people planted by the regime, or make, make just criminals. I also understand that in a state of chaos, some good people can become bad people because of the pressures, because of the uh, PTSDs. People go through all kinds of things because of the violence that they see every day, because of the, the, because of the stress. And, and, and people snap, good people snap, and they decide to do some stupid things. Those ones are the ones that sometimes we, we, you, you will take them and bring them back to order. Or you see, they, in that case, in my own case, I discovered in my, from my training, they might need help. Uh, even though you, they, you can look at them as criminal or wayward at that time, they need help because they themselves are passing through something they never imagined in their lifetime. So this is very characteristic of the war environment. Every war in this era. The problem, the responsibility goes back to the individual who declared the war in the first place. And um, uh, now, I mean, uh, there, there are quite a lot of things you've just said there, but then I would just want to pick um, uh, you on this. Uh, if you responded to that, is, uh, and as a commander-in-chief, because if you're president, then you're commander-in-chief, uh, don't you have a responsibility to make sure that your soldiers or your fighters are identifiable? Because by not identifying them, you make them uh, blend in with the population and therefore by default puts everyone else in, in, in at risk and also makes it easier for anyone to imitate them. So is that not a responsibility you have to be able to get, make sure that your soldiers maybe have a uniform? And uh, secondly, if uh, you are given the argument um, of uh, PTSD and uh, all that uh, people snapping, uh, don't you think that is an argument that can also be, 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 be peddled on both sides? I mean, we see a lot of veterans both here in the UK and in the USA who are suffering from PTSD. So uh, would that not be an argument that the BR regime will also use to justify the killings on both sides? It is, it, is, it is more an argument for the victims than the perpetrators because they had a choice to do or not to do. When they started using helicopter gunships to shoot us, we're carrying leaves. This is more than any trauma a man can suffer for just carrying peace plans and saying, this is what we want, this is what we don't want. 
there must be some change. And then the same soldiers there with machine guns and helicopter gunship killing people again. The shock is, the, the, the greatest shock goes to the victims, of those victims who have been killed, just uh, uh, killed, cold-blooded, killed like that on the streets. Sometimes my own brother was shot on the bed. He was sleeping on the bed. Because when they came to raid, he could not, he was not feeling well. So he could not even run. But my old mother was able to escape, run to the bushes. They made him sleeping on the bed and trying to say, I am not well. They shot him. They, 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 if we're talking of, the, of that argument of PTSD and so on, the shock, that, that comes out of the shock or a traumatic situation, the real victims are, the, I mean, the real victims are the Amazonians. Not these people who shot and uh, they kill and with impunity and laugh and they enjoy and they, and, and, and they are happy about what they do and, and, they, uh, and they count their numbers and, and, and they give themselves high five. You, you have seen from how they even take time to videotape it uh, from the early days, how they, they kill family, kill babies. And, and that is, so the, the, vic, the, the victim is, the, is the, the victim here is an Amazonia. The fact that in trying to defend themselves, certain actions are done is not to be equated to what the oppressor is doing. Let me ask you a question. At what point does the act of self-defense constitute a crime? I am staying me, my, I'm in my house in my family. You come prepared, trained, well instructed, certified by your government that you are there to protect and defend. And you come to me, instead of you to use your training, your knowledge, your certification, your whatever you have, your initial, you come and you are coming to kill me. And you kill mother, you kill father, you rape wife, you burn houses, you burn my, my motorcycle, and, you, and, and, and I become like a fugitive. If I see you come again against me, what is it that I should do and I should not do so that I don't commit a crime? You cannot yeah, well, put I mean, the I, listen. You cannot yeah. put the pressure on the helpless victim who does not who is not even a match mm -hmm. to the assailant. So yeah, I do agree one hundred percent. But I'm saying here that the pressure remains on the side of the oppressor and the one who declared this war in the first place. I've lost you right there. I don't know what the problem is. Are you hearing me? Yeah, well, sorry. First, there was a... Well, as I was saying, the military um, uh, has that responsibility, but uh, you would agree with me, not everyone in the Northwest and Southwest regions or Southern Cameroons, the former Southern Cameroons, currently identifies as Ambazonian. So there are also victims caught in between. And uh, this is what I'm thinking about. For example, we've got a situation where uh, people are actually um, uh, uh, killed or targeted for, for and called black legs. These are people who have not made a political choice. They are not Ambazonian, but they also don't support the BR regime. So should they actually be paying the price because they don't agree with either side of the ideology? If they, they are not Ambazonians, and uh, who are they? Well, I mean, I am from the northwest of Cameroon. I still uh, don't I, identify as Ambazonian. I respect the rights of every person who wants to uh, fight for independence of Ambazonia, and that is a political right. But until that happens, it's still something in potency, it's not actuality. And so I still hold a Cameroonian passport. I still identify as that. So is that something that I should pay a price for? Nobody on this planet should be victimized for what he believes. 
that you will be held accountable for what you do. Yeah. So, so what your faith, your belief is, is a he right. You have to believe it and it's for you. But your freedom ends where my own starts. You see, so for somebody to say, I don't believe in these people so bad, I will be an enabler. I will work, I will promote, I will use everything to help these people against these people. You, may, you put yourself in harm's way in every revolution on this planet. So it is nobody will, should be uh, persecuted just for being neutral. Nobody should be persecuted just for holding certain beliefs. The way you chose to promote those beliefs, to the extent that you do so, you can be held accountable by those who are hurt by your actions. So to what extent will determine what you actually do? There are people who are cooperating with the soldiers to, is that is that is that is that how to say you are? You can be against the idea of a, a, a sovereign sovereign Cameroons without you enabling soldiers to go and kill other people. So those things, those two are not interchangeable. Okay. That because I don't believe in a, the, uh, in a, a sovereign sovereign Cameroons, I will go and pinpoint all the hideouts and who is and uh, who is doing what in a Bazonia. You do that. It's not just an ideology. You have become an enabler, and that in a revolution is called a black leg. Black legs are not people who are neutral. Okay, um, you know, I mean, I have this um, question. It's um, it's a very, it's almost cliche where they say, "What would Jesus do?" And um, I'm looking at the situation with the, the consternation that is there amongst our people. Uh, with the recent declaration of a lockdown. And we have seen um, so many I disturbing images of uh, people fleeing um, from uh, their home. Uh, we've seen people um, moving over to the uh, other side of um, the divide, um, moving to, to, to LRC, La Republic, to Cameroon, this place where they are supposedly uh, being uh, targeted because they are afraid of the lockdown that is coming. And uh, there is uh, this sense of an impending doom in the air. So my question is, because there are conflicting messages and we have received a lot. This is a question that came from so many people. They wanted to know um, what exactly, what date exactly is, um, is the lockdown and does the, the, the Ambazonia interim government support this current lockdown? Yes, we actually work in collaboration with the forces uh, the different actors, uh, we came, uh, we agreed. The good majority of, uh, uh, of all the uh, forces agreed for the lockdown to commence on the 26th. That's on Monday, tomorrow, from 26th of August to the 16th of, of uh, September. And if there will be any further actions, that will be communicated in like manner. Uh, uh, as we go on, and the details are true, it's from the interim government. So um, basically, you're confirming that there is a lockdown starting tomorrow, and that Correct. is um, uh, different from the one that has been announced by the the Ambazonian Governing Council, the AG, the Egg of Sea of uh, Ayabacho Lucas. So there are two dates. Yeah, the, that of the second the, will not. It will begin tomorrow. The second is within his his dates fall within our dates. So to be on the safe side is for you to know that it shall not wait until the second. It will commence tomorrow. So what if now people who adhere to him, who follow him, um, decide to, to, to come out tomorrow? Is that not breeding ground for conflict? We are not into a competition of announcements and who announces mm -hmm. what. Yeah. But to the extent that you know whose voice controls the ground. If you are in Ambazonia, you will not be confused. They, right. know, they know who they are listening to. So if I, if I tell you, you want to believe something that was written on a piece of paper you read on your WhatsApp, you either choose to believe that or you believe what I told you and the communication secretary of Mbazania said. For me, if I'm, uh, my advice is that follow what we say because we have done, we have the, 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 the largest uh, uh, following and we have done the largest consultation so far. And this is... Uh, the decision that is reached. So it is, I think those who are wise, they have already understood.
So um, can you just uh, enlighten some of us what exactly you aim to achieve with the lockdown? Yeah, we, we, have, we have, that is our own weapon of, of, of the fight. When you are fighting somebody who is better equipped than you, who has all the, all the muscles and all the resources than you, whatever you do, uh, uh, like a drowning man, that also, one way or the other, inflicts some pain on the, on the adversary is what you do. Provided, um, uh, and that's what we have done up to this time. If at this point we are now we are considered serious, it's because of our ghost towns, it's because of our lockdowns, it's because we are able to, to a minimum, defend ourselves. This is part of our strategy, which has bled the, the life of big government. That if they say if they, if if it is not, they 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 are losing thousands and thousands and thousands or millions of dollars from from our from our country. If it were possible for us, we will lock down our country perpetually. Let them survive with whatever they have on the other side, and continue to fund the war. Let's see how many how long they will fund the war on the deficit. So we will have to bleed them economically. We have to bleed them administratively. We have to send them out of our land. So, but some would, of, some, some would argue, sir, that you're actually bleeding your own people because um, local women. I saw a video where local women were being chased uh, um, on the 21st uh, of um, August. They were being chased away, and I looked at that video. I saw they had perishable goods. I mean, these are not <clears> the <throat> government. These are local people. Some are subsistence farmers. They've just harvested their goods. They need to sell them. Um, and uh, I mean, in three weeks, uh, I've heard messages saying, oh, stock food, uh, stock medication. Uh, but the question is, um, is the, I, I mean, are we sure that we've got people, the ordinary person uh, within those two regions can actually stock food for more than two, three days at a time? Yeah, we have, that's why we have provided windows for, 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 for such... Uh, uh, replenishment. We have also given the, the we have also given the go ahead to humanitarian uh, organizations, which we endorse. Uh, we, we are talking to them behind for those who can provide to do so. We have we have given our even though in this particular lockdown we have provided uh, them the opportunity to do so to carry out their humanitarian uh, work. But the problem is that we cannot stop fighting until the enemy stop attacking. Nobody stopped defending himself in using what he has. That, uh, when the enemy has not stopped attacking him, nobody does that. And the, the ghost town will continue. Uh, lockdowns will continue. And anything that we have done up to now will continue. It's part of our own warfare. And if you go and ask the Republic, they will tell you how much also they are paying for, for continuing in the, in the path of obstinacy, uh, jailing uh, leaders, uh, uh, killing and maiming, and we are now in the thousands. We are not going to endure these thousands. After all, if we, if we involve, if we, there's a lockdown, people will die. If there's no lockdown, they will kill us. It's good to die resisting and, and, and uh, trying to inflict pain on the enemy than for you to wait and be killed by people who knock and open your door and kill you. So either way you die, that's war. So, yeah, so people death, are running yeah, away. Sir. People are death, running away to the, the place where um, they, are, they are supposedly being oppressed. And uh, does that worry you that people are actually running away? You've got many children who will now go over there. They would learn the language, the culture. They are going to be renting houses. They're going to be buying their stuff. So they're actually still empowering the economy of, um, uh, of Cameroon in Bafusam, Douala, while those of Boya and Bamenda and uh, um, uh, Wum suffer. Nobody said they are being oppressed by, by Francophones. Not Francophones, I mean the government of Cameroon. Yeah, that yeah, economy in Douala is run by the government of the Cameroon. Government, the, the government is oppressing us purposefully, and uh, the, there is no way that by going there, they will not stop, they will stop being oppressed. They are being targeted, even now, even though they are going there. We should remember that thousands more in Nigeria. The, that so-called government is not interested in our people. So movement does not mean a thing. And their situation is not made better by moving out. 
It's just a choice that they have to make in a pattern, in a war situation, because they, 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 they in the in the sheer desire to survive, you can run anywhere. You can even enter into a boat or go anywhere or run into the forest. That's why some are in the forest. The, 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 the closest place they found to be safe is where they just run to, I mean, by instinct. Not, not that those who are in the forest, they're in the forest. Maybe they don't have anywhere to go anywhere. This is what it is. These are the people who have been telling us that the situation is already returning to normal. I used to hear that nonsense. Now, I want them now, in this situation, to go and tell the international community that the situation is returning to normal and that uh, the, the, so everything is okay. Uh, there's no problem in, uh, in, uh, in Southern Cameroon, like Atanganji, their boss, have been saying. We want the world to know and not be deceived that this oppressor has not done anything towards the resolution of this conflict as was uh, 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 demanded by the international community. We want them to know that unequivocally. And anytime the, the oppressor is trying to tell a lie, trying to project one, trying to do propaganda and say everything is okay. These things like this must happen so that they will know that they have not done anything, they're not solving any problem, and if there's any solution on the table, we should pursue that solution to the end. All right, so um, now there is um, of the, the, the questions and the messages that I was getting, one particular audio that really cut me to the heart, and I'll just play it because it was addressed to the IG. I'm just playing it. Where's I go start from? IG. IG, this question is for you. You don't declare three ways go stand. Three ways continue on the IG. IG, you don't ask question whether for that three weeks we go sit down for us, the chop with it. IG, you don't find out whether we get money for stock chop where we go sit down for us, the chop. Okay, I did look at me now. I did cry so now because of my condition. I did, I did for town here for Bamenda. Yeah, I be small Okada man where they manage, though Okada na my own. But work no day. I get 11 people from my house now where they don't come out for whom can they stay with me because of this struggle. For, for about, for a very long time now, I never saved 25 francs. When I work small money where I work, it go correct not correct for we for buy chop late chop for house. Now you don't declare say me we sit down for house for three weeks. With that eleven people I get them for house, I don't even get free for house. How how I would do take money for buy chop where eleven people could chop for three weeks? We say I could take money for stock chop where eleven people could chop for three weeks. I do not be a direct way for just kill we. No, we not direct way that for just finish we kill him. How we go sit down for house for three weeks? Wait till we go the chop. No, be me and my sister, them with my poor mommy, with my woman, my picking them. No, we will die all right. I do why you want to decide for finish we kill him. Left this thing so. Say, man, we want to take rigs for go your school. Me take your rigs go. Man, we no want to take your rigs. Me, 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 she, me, sit down for house. I know everyone will go for school because you know concern me plenty. I do wait to where the crime now plenty now. Wait to where we will jump for these three weeks. I do wait to me and 11 people from my house. Wait to where we will jump for these three weeks. Nobody will just finish with kill them. Nobody now wait that for just finish with kill them. I do. I do reverse this decision. I do. If you think say you the work for our good. Okay, um, that I wanted to get that to his plea where he's begging you. And uh, I mean, this is a practical uh, thing. Um, uh, I've asked op opinion of many people, the opinions of many people, some think, okay, it could be that this person is staging it. But then there are some salient facts there. One, many people don't have fridges. So even if they have fridges, they are no, they are no, um, there's no electricity. Um, an Okada person definitely has no savings. Um, so... Uh, this is a practical situation and and just imagine that that person is really crying and asking you to consider as a leader don't you think you should really look at it again and examine if you're actually not hurting the exact same people you 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 want to protect war hurts everybody war 
hurts everybody and cuts many lives short, not because of hunger, but because they are just shot dead, like game. When people go into a house and take a four months old baby and pump 11 bullets into her body, that's not, that's not, that's not just hunger. That's not just uh, oppression. That's war. Now, I hear, the vo I hear the voice. I wanted to take him serious until he became political. If I were to make that video and I just wanted to talk about my, my feelings, my, I will talk about what I feel what I need. But when you became political about school, about this, about this, let everybody do it. I just, so he makes himself uh, a surrogate of somebody, of the oppressor. That's not the, that's not how you to put your, your, express your pain, especially I would have limited it to the cry of what I'm going to eat. But I also, also want to tell you that whatever we do in the situation of war, which constitute for us an instrument of defense. The responsibility goes to the man who declared the war. If the like, public say everything is under control, they have millions of dollars that they have, they have to, to fight this war. Is, are, why are they spending those millions of dollars only to buy weapons and to buy bullets and gadgets to come and kill us. In a war situation, if, if these people are beloved, let them start taking care of them. Is it, do, do they stop? For example, the people who have moved to the Republic, have they stopped being, claiming them to be their citizens because they are from Amazonia? Let them start taking care of them. They are, they are a government, they have territorial control, they have money. Their money is not just to buy bullets. Let them start taking care of them. Let them also go to hospitals. Let them also go to us to provide medicine. It's their country. It's their, they say it's their country. They say they are in control. Everything is normal. Let them contain the situation that is in their country. I say so paradoxically. It is their country. They say they have control. Something is going on in their country. They have to take care of it. Their responsibility does not come to us. We are fighting. We are using this as an instrument to defend ourselves. Therefore, let them contain the situation. They have to contain it. If they, if they have to ask humanitarian, they are even stopping humanitarian agencies not to go further into the country because they don't want them to, to see the extent of the carnage. This is the time. If they love uh, starting Cameroon, allow humanitarian uh, uh, organizations. They have food. Let them go there without the soldiers of the oppressor accompanying them. Let them go there. They will give some people some food. That for somebody to say that, oh, because they are, they are that you are crying to the IG, cry to the government who declared the war in the first place. Was there any lockdown? Was there any ghost town before this war on us? It, 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 the, these things never happened but as a reaction. So let us go to the, condemn the principal reaction and ask them, what have you done up to now to make sure that this kind of thing don't happen? It's only to take... Uh, uh, nearer 10 and the rest and give them life jail. Th those are the fixes they have, right? They're, that's how to fix the problem so that the country will return to normal. So the question is, what have they done to, to make this kind of actions not to happen again? If they have not done anything, then let them prepare to contain the mess that they have created, which is going to, con which is going to take different dimensions like this one, for example. Okay, so um, yeah, well, I mean, uh, like I did say, I I could not verify the authenticity of the video, but I wanted to put myself in the context of someone living in that region. You you made you make the claim that uh, war kills people, but I know that that war is definitely not going to kill me, and uh, because I am fortunate, I'm just a fortunate person. It's not because I'm stronger than the people back home. I happen to be out here. And so I'm not going to die. So the question um, uh, I, I grapple with is, I mean, because when I think about the fact that people have got to go to hospitals, doctors and nurses have still got to go to work. Sick people have got to be transported emergently uh, to, to hospital. And uh, there's a blanket lockdown. Uh, is it not creating a situation where someone comes out and uh, everywhere is deserted because there's a lockdown? They come out, they're rushing to hospital because it's happened in the past. 
where someone comes out and the military actually shoots the person because they think for someone to have dared to come out, there must be an Amazonian fighter. And also, if they come out, I've, I have a case of a taxi man who Amazonians um, stopped, you know, well, you said I shouldn't say Amazonian fighters, but people imposing, trying to stop the, uh, the um, to some sort of effect the lockdown. They stopped a taxi man and burnt his taxi. But guess what? He was carrying someone to a hospital because there are no ambulances. So what I'm trying to understand is the practical uh, realities on the ground. And drawing from that, I mean, there are some practical uh, things that have not been addressed. I, I mean, we all agree. I am an activist. I believe there is a problem with the Cameroon government, but I just believe that maybe we can deal with it differently um, than which does not hurt our people because I'm looking at you now as because that person says IG. I want to believe that they are talking to you because they trust you to be their authority rather than uh, Paul Beer. If that person denounces Paul Beer, then they come to you. You cannot send them back to Paul Beer. So what do you now, if that person is talking to you as their leader, as that woman in Akwaya or that woman in Kikaikilaiki talking to you, who recognizes you as their leader and tells you, look, my practical situation means that I would die off in these three weeks. Will you refer them to Paul Beer? No. In, in our African context and in our Amazonian context, we, we are willing in communities and in, in villagers, we have been instructed before now how to help one another in this trying moment, how to share what you have with your neighbor until this moment passes. This is what we do during war. This is what we have been doing with or without lockdown. So the people, when the soldiers want to kill people, they don't even kill them because they are threats. When my brother was killed on the shot on the bed, he was a threat to nobody. When the mother of four months was shot 11 times, there was, she, was, she was not a threat to anybody. When they burned 315 villages, burned down, those villages, those houses standing there were not threats to the people. When they are, all the, the people, they have, the lives they have decimated, it is not because at, one, at every point they were threats to them. There is a, an agenda to kill us if possible, eliminate every one of us and own the land because they don't care about us. They did not marry to us, they marry to the land <clears throat> and they want to keep it by all means. So this is the agenda. For somebody to say that it's now that the people are going to die, no. There is a clear agenda to make sure that they will, they, they will only do one thing. They will not bring any fix, no, no solution to the problem but they will use their military might and lead us as a conquered people. That's the agenda. Listen, if we fight, this is what is the reality. If we fight this oppressor called the Republic, we may die. But there's a possibility we may leave. Some may leave. But if we don't, they have no other solution. Tell me which solution they have provided for uh, since three years' time when we started. Which one has been a solution that addresses the root cause of the problem? This to tell you that they don't have any solution in mind. They have one option. Kill these people as many as you can, destroy them, and bring them to their knees and rule them as a conquered people. So we will all die anyway based on this philosophy, based on this approach that they have, with, with, but through a war or without a war. So for somebody to tell me that there's another way to fix it, I really want the person to tell me which is that way more than the 22nd of September, when we carried peace plans in our thousands, I don't want to give figures because they will become controversial. What, we, what, do we, what do you expect us to do? What we, should we do? Take the fight to Yaoundé, for example. Take it how? Of the course. Yaoundé, um, the, the, you, are, the, you, you talked about self-defense before and being offensive. One way of being offensive is to actually go to the territory of the of the of the of the oppressor. Um, uh, the United States did it um, when they suspected that <laughs> Afghanistan was a threat to them. They went to Afghanistan and fought a war in Afghanistan. They did not invite Afghanistan into their territory to fight. Um, they went into Iraq, preemptive strike. So um, can't you do a preemptive strike on your own day? Mr. Kingsley, we have to know the problem we are dealing with before we proffer solutions. 
We are not just trying to divide a country that has existed. Legally, we have never been one country. Because for there to be a country, La Republic had their independence on 1st January 1960. And their boundaries were frozen according to the United Nations treaties. And in September, they became members of the United Nations without La Republic, without Southern Cameroons. We got our independence on October, uh, 1st of October 1960 by joining them. And in the act of joining two sovereign territories, there is supposed to be a treaty of union between the two entities ratified by their separate houses of assembly and deposited at the United Nations. That did not happen. So there is no, no legal union between the two of us. That is why our maps in the, in the archives of the United Nations are still two maps. The only way our, our boundaries can be dissolved and recreated is through an act of union. And that union, that act of union must be deposited at the United Nations. It, it has not happened. We are rising up to affirm our separateness, restore that which we were and that which we are, because that's not been taken away from us. What we have is a, is a, is a de facto union, not a de jure union. There's no legal, uh, legal instrument binding on. And I'm saying that that is why we are fighting to defend the restoration of uh, our independence restored. That's what we are defending. So you cannot be defending your, 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 um, your independence restored and you go to somebody else's capital and say, I'm taking the war to that capital. To go and fight what? If our fighters are in Yaoundé, they'll be fighting who and for what? They are resisting the oppressor and the, the elements that, uh, and, the, and the instruments that are in place to, to, to occupy our territory illegally and deny us the right to exist as a separate people in a failed union. So we have to learn to defend ourselves. If we took all this thing that we do, take it to Yaoundé, then what are we fighting for? No. I mean, when, I mean, uh, fighting, when, when the African countries were fighting for independence, they did not go to the European metropolis. They fought for it where they are, where they call their own soil. This is a case of annexation, a case of uh, recolonization. Uh, the, the fight, well, I would argue that the fight for, for the liberation of Africa started in um, 1945, the Manchester Conference. It was here in, in the United Kingdom. So they came, I mean, Krumah and his cohorts were right here at the, the heart of the empire. Uh, but um, uh, you're correct. I mean, uh, if you want to look at it as a separate thing, but I was just looking at a tactical uh, situation here. If you are in Yaoundé, um, you are doing guerrilla warfare in Yaoundé, you would draw the military towards Yaoundé rather than towards yourself, rather than lockdown. So that was me just saying, is there no possibility? I'm not a war strategist. I, um, I'm, I was just looking at, because you asked what other option. And I was saying, well, I know that I've seen war being waged. The United States and Afghanistan are two separate countries. But the United States went into Kabul. Um, and, and their justification was that's preemptive, defensive, but they had to, to attack so that they are not attacked. So um, that was my logic of asking that. But um, like you say, I mean, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's got historical connotations, but I'm looking at it, it, it and wondering, are your people not under more pressure? And will they be able to sustain when they have got this for that long? And now when with people fleeing, is that not really counterproductive? It, it, what, it, it is not counterproductive because that is the chaos our people live every day anyway. It was just not seen in that light. But if that's this reality, when my mother lived in the forest for eight months, because it was not seen, it was normal. If she had moved to La Republic, it would be news that, okay, they are now moving to La Republic. These ones are just news because the camera caught them. The ones who are in the forest, nobody is taking pictures of them on a daily basis. This is the chaos our people are living daily. 
It's just a, a few, a handful you can see in vehicles trying to go the other way. Some of them might even be from La Republic or of La Republic, La Republic origin. So they want to move to their families and their relatives. There's some are ours that may have friends or so. But the vast majority are, are everywhere in Amazonia, probably in the forests. And nobody is uh, uh, focusing their camera on them. This is the chaos we are living every day. It's not being created now. It is just being manifest. It is just being manifest because it is happening where we can take pictures and see. And so that it also serves the, uh, the, the, us for the international community to see that anyone who is moving around, going around, saying that they have solved the problem, the, the dialogue has taken place, things are returning to normal, is a blatant liar. Okay, so um, let's uh, move now on to something we've talked about again, and it's about um, governance. Um, you know, in May 2019, uh, Sisiko Ayutabe published a letter from jail. I mean, it supposedly was published by him. I'm not sure if that was from him or not, because I don't know how um, communication works. That, but in that letter, um, there was um, uh, a, a, a quote, which I would read. It says, the caretaker cabinet, that is your cabinet, has lost Yeah, so uh, sorry, sir. I don't know why this this has not happened before, but we seem to be um, cut off edge um, at some crucial moment. So I was asking, uh, uh, you did not accept uh, the the decision by by Sisiko Ayoktabe. Is it because you felt he he didn't have the authority to to pass that decision, or because uh, you think that his assessment of your leadership and his achievements was wrong? Um. If you are, if there is, if an acting president was elected, it was because the substantive president was inactive, was incapacitated by reason of incarceration. That means in that capacity, he cannot exercise power. So when you have an acting president, you cannot exercise power. So because you are still, especially when you are still in a state of incapacity. So based on that argument, it was just wrong. We, even without listening to the Restoration Council, it was wrong. The question we should answer in a constitutional republic is what powers was he exercising at that time? If the powers reside with the acting because his state of incapacity is persistent, then how, which power did he exercise by dissolving cabinet? So that is why the Restoration Council swiftly took act, the rightful action to stop and render that action null and void because that's what it was. Yeah, um, just talking of the Restoration Council, I, I think um, Elvis Kometa, the um, uh, the person who signed that document uh, did use um, the words uh, say, uh, saying that uh, Sisiko had been impeached for treasonous misconduct. Uh, so um, can you confirm that he was actually impeached? Yes, but the first, the first um, letters, because there are letters involved that were, were resolutions, a couple of resolutions, the impeachment was the final resolution. But, but the, the first one was to condemn that action and require that he should uh, uh, withdraw that action. Um, but, but he did not. Impeachment came at the end. Uh, when, after a reasonable time, that he did not uh, withdraw the decision or counsel it. 
And so the, the Restoration Council made that determination, which they had won in the previous letter, that there will be actions uh, uh, that may include the impeachment. And the impeachment was done. The removal of, from office was carried out by an act of the Restoration Council. Not so if, if he was incapacitated, sir, how do you um, um, uh, impeach someone who was actually not in office anymore? I mean, by impeaching him, that, that's an acknowledgement that he actually was still in power because you only in, impeach someone who is in power. You see, the word that was used was removal from office because impeachment is another thing. But, but the fact that he was acting in a state of incapacity in ways that were jeopardized was, were considered to be uh, 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 detrimental to the functioning of the interim government. The Restoration Council made that determination that these actions were, were uh, treasonous. Let me give you an example. On the day that the cabinet or the appointment was done by President Sisiko, on that day, our community was in New York. For the first time in our history, we were uh, at the United Nations at the behest of the, uh, I mean, the Security Council was meeting at the behest of the United States government to have a hearing on the humanitarian conditions in our country. And we know that this is a, an opportunity we wanted for years. And this is how, uh, this is the process that leads the international community to be able to intervene sometimes unilaterally to correct a situation. As the, it was raining in New York and the people were there under umbrella, un soaked by the rain, trying to make their voices heard while the Security Council was meeting. That is the day he chose to uh, uh, dissolve the cabinet, to make a proclamation of dissolution of the cabinet. And, and make a statement that says that anybody listening to the cabinet he has dissolved is doing so at his or her own risk, creating a deliberate confusion in the minds of whoever was even listening to us, that he may not be listening to the legitimate authority. That confusion was not necessary at this time for any reason under heaven. That is treasonous, as it was determined by the internet, by, 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 uh, by, by the Restoration Council, reading through their own uh, their own instruments, they said this treats on us because it's like a, like like organizing the coup d'état on the day of 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 victory, when Ambazonia was at the highest point so far that we had attained to for for us to be here, and it was not surprising that a week after, uh, Karen, Congresswoman Karen Bass was telling the United Nations that. The international community doesn't, doesn't know who to talk to. Yeah, well, I mean, um, I also don't know. Is Yerima your vice president? Because I see he signs uh, documents under the, the IG as vice president. Is he your vice president? He is not my vice president. He's not the vice president of the IG that was constituted by a constituent assembly. Because no. any other IG that was not constituted by a constituent assembly was constituted probably by the whims of an individual. Okay, now I'm um, using the word uh, treasonous. Um, that's a very strong word. And uh, we woke up on um, the, uh, the morning of uh, 20th August to the sentencing to life of Sisiko and uh, all the rest of uh, the people and um, a fine of 250 billion francs CFA. I mean, um, don't you think that uh, that could, uh, the, the use of the words treason to describe someone who is incarcerated in what supposedly is an enemy's camp? Um, basically was uh, yeah, giving leeway for such a huge um, condemn condemnation from them. I don't know when the actions of La Republic have been guided by our decisions as a government. Yeah, if that is the case, then I will be surprised. Uh, um, they have their own laws. They don't, they don't judge the people they abduct or whatever by what the rules we have set for ourselves. I think they should have laws. I think they have, they say they have nation It's of a lawless laws. state, sir. It's a lawless state. We all agree on that. I did say so from the start when that the it's contentious. When the magistrate seeks to decide on the case, he's not deciding on what Ambazonia says. 
But what, what their law says or concerning this, the, the, the matter and the circumstances, I think so. So, it's, it's, so the sentencing so is legal then? So it's a legal yeah. sentence? So it is, they're going to use their own laws, whatever laws, whether good or bad, that's what they're going to use. They're not going to use the law according to what some restoration council of an interim government that they don't recognize has said or done. Well, my yeah. point is, uh, sir, that by pulling support from those incarcerated, it give, gave them the opportunity to actually uh, carry out that sentence. Um, because, I mean, I would just say, uh, Honorable Weber did say that he's a revolutionary saint. And uh, on Daily TV here, when Ayabacho Lucas came, he also supported, said, oh, you shouldn't have attacked um, someone in jail. I mean, uh, is it not um, somehow a blow below the belt to, to have um, pulled the rock from someone who is incarcerated in the enemy's I, territory? I don't agree with your characterization. Uh, um, now, there is a difference between an individual and his actions. Mm -hmm. In the political space, we'll hold you responsible for your actions. So what were the actions were described as treasonable. And this gentleman that that most of whom came into office before I came there, I came to this office, who are in charge of the Restoration Council, made that determination by the very uh, texts of the law and the constitution that was drafted not by me, but by President Sisiko himself. They made that determination. Uh, so they are, they, 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 that, that is, that's what it is not uh, tantamount to giving the person over to the devil, but it is to condemn an act which is wrong. Even if you are sinned, that doesn't make all your actions right. Oh, yeah. So a wrong thing is a wrong thing. You don't cover a wrong thing because of who did it. So, so it is clear it was, the action was wrong. It was, it was, uh, was anti-revolutionary at this time. And they considered that it was treasonous. That's, that's the choice of their words. I would wish that some of them would come here one day to your TV and you ask them questions in that regard. No, but, like that. But, but this is exactly what it is. It is not tantamount to a, 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 any punishment even because it is, it is expected that in a nation of law, the laws be interpreted when actions are involved. And in this particular case, he could not continue to exercise the functions while incapacitated. That is already a compromising situation. You cannot be in a situation where you cannot legally act, but you are, you are acting. Uh, thereby making it impossible for us to function live as it's supposed to be. If they made that determination, well, we will live another day. And Bazonians will open the records and see what was right and what was wrong. But so for somebody to say that's the action that ultimately crucified him, wrong. But this is the thing I want to tell you. That action that he took has been the most devastating action that has, has compromised the, the stability of our revolution. That action. And let me say this. Any action that makes the free interim government weaker, that is the action that crucifies those that are held in captivity and those who are in the forest and the refugees. Because if we are weaker, there is no hope for those who depend on our success. Let me say this. Anybody who thinks that by making the interim government weaker, making us unsuccessful, it will speed up our liberation. He doesn't understand. Because if I were in, the, in jail, if I were in the forest, if I was fighting in the trenches, and I want to get out of this, I will not do anything that will weaken the hands of the interim government. Because if the interim government is not succeeding in the prosecution of this struggle, the, the rest whose, whose freedom depend on the success of the revolution, their own lives will be jeopardized. I want to say that the actions that brought us, made us weaker, are responsible for whatever the government uh, of La Republic is doing against our leaders. Because when we are stronger in the revolution, those in jail will be respected. If, if we are really putting the enemy on his heels and they are weeping and crying, then they will respect those that they are holding who represent that revolution. But if we are weak and, 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 and 
and on our knees and not able to prosecute the war, how will they respect and protect them? They will instead, they will despise them and do funny things like giving them this kind of jail term. And I also want to say that there is nobody, this action was not a blanket action against the Nella 10. No, that is an extended misinterpretation. It okay. was an action that was clearly taken against the, the act in reaction to an action by President Sisiko. It was not an action that was taken against the, the, uh, uh, Dick Intasa, against uh, Fongala, against uh, Professor Wasum and, and the rest. No, that's a malicious extension. Okay, so um, so is there any plan you've got for to challenge um, as a, a, a government to challenge that decision, that um, sentence? We are, there's one thing we can do and that we have to do. We have to strengthen our hands in the fight. There has to be escalation. I believe that the stronger we get against the opponent, the, the, the greater the, uh, the assurance we have that our own, that they are holy, will not be killed, that they will not die in jail, that because our success will determine their freedom. So we are going to double down to do the things we have to do to put the enemies back on the wall, to make sure that we don't relent with diplomacy. I would not relent with, the, with fighting and defending ourselves because if we, if we lost team at this time, they will say to themselves, their strategy is working. So why should they change it? Okay, so um, now let's uh, talk about something that uh, a lot of questions, there has been a lot, quite a lot. I mean, it's dominated our questions and even right here, people keep reminding, I can see on the screen there, and it's the, on the issue of accountability. And uh, we know that since they face, they, they start of this phase of the revolution, there have been an avalanche of crowdfunding, fundraising. There have been an equal measure of accountability issues, starting with Skapak, um, starting with questions about the lawsuit that was supposed to be brought by Foley Hawk, um, that was to have a retainer of 35,000. Uh, this, but um, the questions that we keep getting is uh, about my trip to Boya, which was a flagship program that you started. Uh, in your uh, words published on the, the 12th of March 2018 on the website of uh, my trip to Boya, you say it is your chance um, to put, uh, to plant your stake on the ground and make a down payment on your future in a big way. We together must materialize our commitment to the future your nation we've dreamt and talked about for 60 years. Our jail leaders and your compatriots are counting on you. I invite you to tell everyone about my trip to Boya. I urge you to make this campaign a resounding success. This is about the future. We expect to easily exceed the $2 million uh, target we've set for ourselves. Um, now, did, uh, the question is, did you meet your targets for my trip to Boya? Did you meet your $2 million target? No, <clears throat> the target was in time and in amount. The target is we needed about two million in a month. So after about six, four, uh, four month endeavor or thereabout, uh, I don't know from the audit report, it's about five months or so, we're able to get a third of the money. So why, why do you think people didn't really donate to that? I mean, um, you, you promised that if you were to raise that money, you were going to deliver something. So why do you think people didn't donate? This has been the problem within the struggle for a long time. The question you can ask is that there has been a governing council and then an interim government for about three months or four months before I came. How much money was raised? How much money did I find in the coffers? Not, not probably not, led, not more than some cheap shipping change. So it is not a problem that happened when I, I even launched out a program. The truth is that after the abduction of the leadership, the people fell down even emotionally to a point of discouragement. A lot of people actually thought that the end, the, stru the struggle has come to an end. So there were those who said, well, I don't want to involve myself in something that is going to nowhere. So people were still discouraged in an emotional valley 
struggling. So where I was actually going to dig them out of that state to tell them there's still a possibility we are going to go here. But it, before me, there was that situation, there was total enthusiasm. The population was, uh, was people were for citizenship levy, people, uh, the, 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 everybody was celebrating uh, the, 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 the birth of the governing council and the, uh, and the uh, interim government. When there was no shock of who has been, uh, who has been adopted or anything, no shocking development. Yet, where was the money? But I didn't see it. Maybe the money was there, they, they, they vanished before I arrived. But so I'm telling you that it was in our DNA, there is something wrong. People are, they are concerned about what is happening, but they are not committed. We have to move, we have to move, uh, change, transform our, our, our concern to commitment. And that is the job we do through mobilization, through campaigns, through education. But unfortunately, you see people who say, I am from there, they burn my village, they lament this and that. You ask them, are you giving? How much do you give to alleviate the, 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 the suffering of your people? How much did you give? Since when did you give that amount? The commitment is the problem. And, and it, is, it is in, if, judging from the fact that we have experienced this in, uh, from, from the beginning, uh, you, so you will say that it is in us. Something has to happen. Many people are the fire brigade givers. When there's fire on the mountain, they donate. When mm -hmm. the fire leaves their village and goes to the next village and says, let the people from that village see what to do about that. So, uh, uh, but, but today, we have decided to change the, the, the dynamics by making the people to focus in their local governments. Because see the devastation that's going on in your local government. It concerns people you know, families you know, neighbors you know, friends that you know. And this, they look on you as somebody who can help. So organize yourself in these communities so that you can see the reality of this war and see how you can help your IDPs and the rest of the people. I think that more people are now motivated to give, if not for any reason, but to help the people they know. And that's what is going on now with different local governments and counties. So was uh, my trip to Boya more like a humanitarian fund or was it a war chest? It was humanitarian. I want to remind you that self-defense is a humanitarian act. Yes, I know that is shocking to many people. If you are killing my own and killing people here on the street and I come out with a gun and take you down, I should be celebrated as a hero. I have just carried out a humanitarian act because without that humanitarian action, it's an, a humanitarian action is an action that you take in order to stop the killing of people or the dying, that people from dying. So the real act of self-defense is the humanitarian act. All right, um, I mean, because uh, it was my understanding as an outsider looking at the issue of my trip to Boya. I mean, the, the interpretation that I got talking to people was that, oh, if um, uh, you got two million, you were going to uh, deliver independence. So that was what I wasn't sure how money was going to deliver the independence within uh, three months. I mean, there, there was a question um, which someone said, you promised if you did not deliver within three months, we are going to resign. Um, so I don't know. I've not seen you say that. So maybe you just clarify for me. Did you make that commitment? It, it, um, uh, you, if you had played my video and then you hear me talk, and then you ask me a question, we will really be talking about the facts and not some... Uh, in windows and the way the people decide to put things. Mm -hmm. Somebody, I asked for an amount of money within yeah. a specific time. I knew the threat we were facing. I knew what we were doing in the legal front. I knew what we were doing in the diplomatic front. It is a whole package that we need to set our people free. If somebody tells you that there's just one thing we need to do to be free, it's a lie. Oh. When somebody says that we walk towards independent, yeah, it's a whole package. I knew what was needed here and what was needed here, what was needed on the ground. If you know this history, our short history very well, you will know that this war was basically around Manu and a little around Meme. That is how this war was. They were killing and maiming and refugees all over the place. They were flooding into Nigeria. That is where we met it. And so we had a strategy and another strategy. And this needed this amount of money as quickly as possible because 
as we were going to be walking, the enemy will be spreading. The enemy will be, will be fight, will be, will be doing everything to crush us as a people. That was not done. Unfortunately, many people don't care about time. They only care about what you say. Uh, they don't care about the amount. They only care about what you say. But this was conditional on something. If one to be logical, we will say, okay, based on this condition and on this condition, which one was met? Now that these conditions were not met, what were we able to do? I want to say that. I can say this. That we were able to do with the little we had. We were able to sustain the legal defense of our leaders in jail with close to $100,000. Somebody will say it's bad investment. Somebody will say it's good investment. But we know that they are, they are, how we treated them will de also depend on how they were treated and how the, the, the people will look at them and the international community and even the oppressor will need to do something. We did that out of it. Somebody, some people told me today that it was the wrong decision. I was not supposed to spend money for that at all. So I left them like that. But based on the amount, amount of money, we were also able to make sure that we keep communication running. We needed to have a television running. And the television was already there, taking about $12,000 every month. We spent close to 100000 trying to keep ourselves, keeping our revolutionary voice intact. Some people would say that was not good enough. You should have just forgotten that, that. But that was a decision we took. Based on the little we got, we're still able to spread the enemy thin. From the moment my chip to boya became a reality, the flaws notwithstanding, the war became a war of 13 counties. If somebody told you that it just happened by accident, no, it's not by accident. Because, because camps and other things, people here and there organizing so as to be able to resist. From that moment, move from Manu to cover the 13 counties. How? It's not just by speaking, but by supporting. You heard the cries. We don't get granola, we don't get granola, we don't get granola all over the place. Not just from Manu, all over. Because that is what I cannot go into any details to say. But we did not, we did not accomplish all, but we did not also have what we need, we asked for. But what we did today has been able, was able to put the pressure on the enemy. We the enemy that was celebrating that our leaders were already captured on laser decapitate. We have finished, the movement is finished, and they were popping champagnes and visiting our chiefs, telling them it's all over. Suddenly, it was not over. They knew that they have just provoked a lion from sleep and that we are ready to fight. We are not going to die begging. We are going to die fighting. They, then they discovered this. We, and, uh, for, and you see for yourself what, what happened. Today, if we are talking about negotiation, it's because the strategies worked. If we are talking about uh, 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 ceasefire, it's because the strategy worked. Because now you can see that if the, if the ability to defend ourselves cannot bring these people to the table, then what chances would we have had with peace plans and waiting for some mercy to come from somewhere and fall on us? So that is what I can tell you uh, uh, in a nutshell. We tried. We did not get there, neither did the people give us what we wanted. We did not get there, we did not get there. But where we got to us is where, where what has put us at this place now that we are seriously a force to reckon with. We can no more be despised by the Republic du Cameroon again because of what we started doing through my trip to Boya. So um yeah well I mean uh, there is uh, what obviously in, even with um uh, NGOs you've got um donor fatigue with humanitarian organizations you've got donor fatigue because I know that um it took just a day or two to raise almost 18,000 um dollars uh for for Dr. Fontem's car there there was a, an issue with that like I did say there were issues with Scapac there were issues with the um, the money the retainer no one knows what the lawsuit came about could that now therefore have accounted to people not really trusting anyone with money, knowing that the money doesn't, I mean, now not just my trip, was my trip to Boya did not realize his target. Could it be because or there was a trail of, um, of people not being accountable? I see a question there, I'm not sure, but because it's an audience asking, since Sisiko embezzled 12 million, I don't know 
Yeah, if that's true, but that's an audience a member asking, it could be unfounded. But when people raise these questions, uh, could that impact on it? And if it does impact and you couldn't realize your target, could it be now that questions are also being asked, people are not happy with how you spent it, and you, you, you might have been justified, you made um, uh, conscious decisions, um, you, you, they were well thought out, but the people who donate are not confident. Could that now impact your ability to raise funds going forward? You know, let us go back to the beginning. <laughs> Many of us from the beginning of this thing, we were not for a separate country. <clears throat> Most of the people who donated for Fontaine's car were for federalism. Because that is where we were. Majority was at, that, at the face of a federated state. And in that expectation, many people, the pool was, was bigger. We had a bigger pool. And uh, there are some people who were comfortable to give also because of the motive at that time. There are some people who will not give me money because despite all the theology I have expressed here to tell you about the need, the, the how, how self-defense is a human right, how self-defense is, uh, uh, is a humanitarian action, not many people buy that. So if you still give, there are some people who withhold with, who with just for that. You understand? So the motives, the declared objectives, the political positions of the giving that has, that has changed with the evolution of time, and then also, no doubt, the, the cases of alleged impropriety, financial impropriety, all come into play. There are so many factors that affect the size of the giving. But right now, the first quarter, uh, first half uh, audit of the is going on right now. You'll be shocked to know that more money has gone to the struggle within the past eight months than it uh, than it went into the struggle throughout one year that I was in office uh, during my trip to Boyacom with my trip to Boyacom combined. Why? Because people are more motivated now to give to their counties and to their local government where there is, there, the, there is um, transparency. That means they are able to see what is going on, uh, what is done and what is not done. They are able to follow up for themselves and see where the money is going. So more money has gone now through this decentralized unit into this struggle than it has been any time from the beginning uh, for the for the past for the for the first one year including my trip to boya of my presidency so the motivations have changed so more people may give some people will say i cannot give for that reason i want to give it for this reason but they also the problem of lack of transparency in the previous uh, administrations that were in place could, and the way issues were, treat, were treated could also be one of, one of those factors. That's why I called for an audit. Nobody forced one on me. I called for an audit, and I did not appoint the auditors. I asked the counties to elect and select their best of auditors. So we had 13 auditors appointed by their own counties to come and examine our records. That were, that were kept by the Department of Finance and Economy. And if you have seen the audit report, you can see it for yourself. But if such, le such levels of transparency, if they were kept throughout, right from the beginning, it will also preserve some people who want to see the numbers and the figures, and they want to see before they go, before they can give more. But I want to, I want to also give a word of caution that in a situation of war, it is very tricky uh, there is, we have to balance between uh, the, uh, the security of our struggle and the need for transparency. If we don't find a good, a fine balance, we'll be shooting ourselves on the foot, trying to, to display accountability or transparency. Go and ask mm -hmm. all those who are managing local governments and counties. Ask them, 
which one of them is ready to do an, an audit and publish the results like I did? They will tell you, they will give you more answers than I've given you right now because it's very tricky. Yeah, well, um, the, this is a question from someone um, just uh, writing on Facebook asking that whether when you are raising funds from the public like that, um, how do you um, uh, deal with uh, laws uh, in, say, the United States or in the, the United Kingdom? Uh, are those funds tax deductible? Do you pay tax on them and things like that? And how, I mean, if um, are you not worried of an IRS uh, audit? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> as a non-governmental organization, it is, it is tax exempt. So I don't know, it depends on the status in every country. I was recently in, in the UK. The, the Sarin Cameroon community in UK has a certain status. They have to work within the laws uh, uh, for whatever the, the fundraisers they are doing. So we are not ignorant. Uh, we have a lot of people who are experts in those domains that make sure that there is compliance uh, all the way. That's all I can say. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I mean, you did launch uh, something called the Masha Investment Plan. Um, was that just an extension of my trip to Boya? No, the Masha Investment Plan, we have modified it um, because there is need for us to get people who are ready now uh, potentially to invest in a free Amazonia who are ready to take the risk with us to give us the kind of resources we need at this time to, uh, to win our, our li this liberation war and also to plan effectively for a free Amazonia. So that and that project has been, has been modified. Okay. And uh, it, it is no more called the Marshall Investment Plan. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, uh, the, the impression I got from both my trip to Boya and this investment um, plan, whatever now it's been called, is that people who have got the ability to invest certainly get some sort of recognition. Does not, does not, does not create a system where uh, should you get independence, you enter into a new state with some people being um, uh, uh, bigger shareholders or stakeholders than the ordinary person who is in the forest and hasn't got the ability to make such an investment. Well, today, we are, everything we have has been taken away without anything for years. And if the condition, if the situation continues like that, we'll get nothing in our lifetime, not even our children. So there are two ways. Either we come together amongst ourselves and make it an internal debt. We get the resources from ourselves, as we are doing right now, to free our land so that when we win, whoever is to be recognized for what he did is going to be an Amazonian. So the money, <laughs> our resources move from Boya to Tiko, from Tiko to Mutengen. It has not gone anywhere. Or we go outrightly to sell the country as La Republic sold their own to France. So we, we, we can also go outrightly and go and meet people who will buy the country before we get it. And then by the time we get it, we, are this, uh, we have transferred from one slave master to another slave master. I think that whatever we have done, which is an internal arrangement, which we hope that it works, that we get resources from amongst us for those who are able, whatever the reward we give to our own for putting their resources on the line for our freedom, it is savings to and by the community because it is not, it is not enslavement the community. And I want to also say that we are all involving ourselves at different levels. There are different different uh, uh, sacrifices. Some people sacrifice with their lives. The sister, our government will have a way of compensating them, recognizing them and their families. For some people sacrifice with money. Some people sacrifice with service. We live off free, putting our lives on the line. There will be a way of recognizing all these sacrifices. And what about those who did not have any opportunity to give? Neither did, would they have an opportunity to fight. They, are, they, are, they, are, they will win a free country, full of opportunities, full of post-war uh, uh, reconstruction and other privileges for those who are involved. 
uh, who have been affected as victims of one way or the other. That's the program that will come to be. But to everyone, according to his sacrifice, this country has enough for all the 8 million of us. All right, um, so, uh, so and um, you, you, uh, the ID card scheme, you recently launched an ID card scheme. Um, how, how is that going? I mean, is that for people who are living in, 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 uh, uh, on Ground Zero or people in the diaspora? Primarily, it is for people in the diaspora because everybody who is not in La Republic, I mean, who is not in Ambazonia, in British Southern Cameroon, is in the diaspora. And, uh, but to the extent, uh, depending on the security at, uh, situation, because we don't want to endanger the life of anybody by a piece of paper that he carries in his wallet. Now, but all of us in the diaspora, we really need a process of start identifying ourselves as citizens of this country, which exists legally and it is yet to exist territorially. We have to start giving ourselves the legal recognition and carry the paper around. Because if we don't identify ourselves legally as Southern Cameroonians, then the Republic will continue to identify with a fake identity card and a fake passport. Because, <clears throat> uh, uh, le because legally we are not the Republic. And um, we think that one day this problem might be resolved one way or the other by a, re a referendum. Maybe. And if we don't, if we don't start identifying who is a citizen of Amazonia, then the Republic would identify who is a citizen of La Republic resident in Amazonia, and that will make a mess of our expectations. So we have to ensure that we start identifying our own citizens from their local government level upward, and then we issue them identity card and issue them certificates of citizenship. So that some of them in the diaspora who have need for um, uh, as, asylum and refugee status, they need when they carry a foreign passport, say La Republic or a Nigerian passport, and they cannot show their relationship, how connected they are to the struggle. They, they have difficulties getting that recognition or giving granted that status. But by issuing them these papers, there is a clear connection between them, no matter the passport they are carrying and the struggle that they are requiring protection for uh, and they are running away from, then it will help a lot of them to get their citizenship, uh, their asylum status uh, corrected and uh, adjusted or their refugee status. Please, uh, can I just have one question so I can go now because of my time? Yeah. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Okay. I can't hear you. This is the failure of technology. I don't know if you are hearing me because I can't hear you. <clears throat> well, let, let, let's call it a day so I can catch up another meeting, hoping that we'll have it next time. And uh, probably the, the technology shall be kind to us.
Okay, let me just go. We'll call it off. Honest, I not know what. <laughs> But he wants to go, so you want to cut it then? Yes, I'm, I'm just trying to understand why the sound just went. Um, is he not back yet? It's not back yet. Uh, sadly enough. Uh, hello. Mm. Hello. Yeah, I don't know if you can hear me now. If you can hear me, just uh, make an indication because it looks like the sound is back. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> let me just check on this device. Yeah, well, um, uh, we're really sorry that the sound got cut off for some reason. Um, by the time uh, we, we could sort it out, uh, you know, Dr. Sako had to go and uh, we still had a number of things to cover, but his parting words, he did indicate that he was fine to come back because there are a number of things we were uh, looking to, to talk uh, and, and just in form of rounding up. And we want to apologize for that. And, um, uh, you know, there were so many questions that people had. We couldn't reach all of those questions. I could see some of them. Some of them have been dealt with. Um, I know uh, Dr. Sako uh, and his team would um, look back on these questions and they would uh, answer them uh, in their subsequent broadcasts or uh, some of the queries. I know people have asked again the same questions that have been asked about the, the lockdown. People have, have got issues about my trip to, uh, to Boya. Um, people have still got issues. And um, the last question, which maybe as uh, Dr. Sako would clarify, uh, was the question I was asking him before I got cut off was about the, the passport he holds. And the reason I was asking that question was if he doesn't hold an Amazonian passport, does it mean therefore that he holds the passport of another country, yet he's the president of Amazonia? So um, those questions and many more uh, would be asked in our subsequent broadcast. I want to thank everyone who um, made this possible, who gave us questions to ask um, I know that you might not be satisfied entirely with the questions or the, the answers that we, you received, but you have to know we have a very uh, tight schedule here and we have to deal with it and move from one thing to another. Um, thank you so much for being um, here with us on Daily TV. We thank you for your um, uh, patronage. We thank you for, for being here with us uh, on such a lovely afternoon where you could have been somewhere else. Um, keep your um, uh, questions coming as we have more guests uh, because this platform is here to promote uh, discussion, um, to listen to, to different sides of the story. We do not, as Daily TV, uh, necessarily endorse what the, the, the guest is saying, but we have to give them the opportunity to express themselves because that is what a civilized society does. Um, so thank you very much and uh, thank you for the production team. Uh, thank you for all the crew of um, Delhi TV. Uh, I have been your host, uh, Kings Dishetenew, and um, look forward to seeing you again um, during another very, very exciting um, session where we will be having yet another interesting guest on Delhi TV. Thank you and have a lovely weekend, uh, rest of the weekend and um, a wonderful week ahead. <laughs>